Welcome to Disciples Net Church. We're glad you've decided to join us today. As our usual pattern is, we will have music, scripture, prayers, and a sermon. And we always follow with the feast at the welcome table. And so we invite you to prepare to join us today. Enter into the worship today with a spirit of love and joy. Be prepared to learn, be prepared to share in our music, and as always, realize that you are part of a fellowship that extends around the world. And so come in to this centered space today and join us. And now we enter that spirit of worship. Welcome. today from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, beginning with verse 21. In this passage, we see as last week, Jesus in the beginning stages of his ministry and the Gospel writer Mark teaching us a little bit about who this Jesus is. The disciples that Jesus has gathered have entered Capernaum. And being the Sabbath, Jesus goes to the synagogue and is allowed to teach as is customary for visitors. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once Jesus' fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. May God add his blessing to the reading and our understanding of this word. Now in a few moments, Bob Shaw is going to bring us our pastoral prayer. But there's something happened since we recorded this that I would like to lift up in thanksgiving. We'd like to give thanks today for a new life that has come into the world. This is a granddaughter of Bob and Susan who you've seen here today. Their daughter and son-in-law have had their first child. And our team members, Bob and Susan, are proud grandparents. We give thanks to God for this new life, even as we give thanks to God for all those who have brought love into our lives. And now Bob will bring us our prayer. You will quickly see today that part of our focus in scripture and sermon is on a story of someone disrupting the community and how Jesus deals with that. And we need to be reminded that we are in community, all of us together. And so we're inviting all of our disciple sheep to join us as we pray today. And I ask you now if you will join us in prayer. Loving and gracious God, again we come into your presence. Again we ask that we might open our hearts and our minds to feel you to hear your word, to 
understand whatever teaching or learning that you might have for us today in these moments of worship. We ask that you would bless us to each other as we continue to be community, continue to be church, and sometimes especially at Disciples Net. It is easy for us to feel that we are just one person and a computer screen. Help us remind ourselves that we're part of something much larger than ourselves, that we are part of a church, a church that is nationwide, a church that is worldwide, a church that is history-wide, a church that is even larger than Disciples Net. Help us take into account what it means to be a brother or sister, your child. Help us look at other people in the world, people whose language we do not even understand, people whose ideas with which we disagree, people whose nations seem to be at war with our own. Help us understand all to be your children and therefore our own brothers and sisters. God, we pray that this sense of reaching out toward one another is truly doing your will in the world. We pray that you would enable and empower us to reach out in love. May we do as you want us to do. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ of each and every one of us. And we ask that you would hear us now as we pray together the prayer that he prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory.
A pastor friend told me of traveling through the countryside once on a Sunday morning and deciding to stop in a little country church along the road to attend Sunday worship. The text of the preacher that day was the same as is ours today about the unclean spirit in the synagogue. The preacher worked himself up into a sweat talking about unclean spirits of demons in the church. He told of how the church needed to look out, how the devil could sneak in unseen and wreck all kinds of havoc. The preacher kept getting more and more worked up over this text until he finally got wide-eyed and shrieked, stretching out his left hand. He pointed to the back corner and said, Look, there he comes. And in that instant, he reared back and threw the Bible he'd been holding in his hand. The Bible whizzed across the sanctuary, skimming over the heads of the congregants, then smacking into the wall with a memorable whoop right where the preacher had been pointing. Perfect aim. Got him, got him, the preacher crowed and danced around and the people went from stunned silence to cheers. My friend says he went away scratching his head thinking, if only it were that easy. The reality is there are unclean spirits in the church today Yes, our understanding has changed in some ways. Yes, theologians continue to debate the true nature of demons. But not many people question the fact that evil does exist in this world, and it comes in all shapes and sizes. But what do we do about it when evil, when unclean spirits get into the church? That unclean spirit in the church can even come into the church and everyday people. Faithful churchgoers, leaders, pastors, and priests. Sadly, many of you know this all too well. Many people listening here have been wounded in church, and for some, the damage was horrible. The scars go deep. Some of Disciples Net's viewers are people who vowed never to set foot in a church again, but are okay with visiting here. It's a little safer, perhaps. And it's a trust that we take very seriously here at Disciples Net. At the same time, we grieve how horrible it is that someone who might have come seeking sanctuary, come seeking God's grace and love and community, had that betrayed. And as we grieve this and vow to do something about it, we know also from Scripture that breaking such a trust is one of the vilest things a person can do in God's eyes. We also have people listening here who have done things they're horrified of and live in shame with their own personal demons. Unclean places to you all. You are the church. We are the church together. The church is the body of Christ made up of humans seeking to follow the ways of Christ. Yet as Paul tells us in Romans, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But friends, today I bring you good news. Believe it or not, despite all we see wrong with the church, there is hope. We may not be able to wipe out all the evil in the world or in the church, but we can work to make things better. And two of the keys to this, to how the church can move forward, are in today's scripture. So let's look closer. Mark's text here is introducing Jesus to his readers. After sharing in a few words about Jesus' baptism, time in the desert, and his calling of his disciples, Mark shows Jesus getting down to the real ministry to which God has called him. And one of the first things that we see is that something here is different about Jesus. Something is different about the way Jesus picks up the Word of God and interprets it. Something is different when Jesus comes into the room. Lives are changed. We need to listen to what this Jesus says. Now, on a side note, we need to be careful in this passage not to put down the Jewish scribes or the Jewish faith, as is sometimes done here inappropriately. There's nothing here that says the scribes weren't capable and competent in doing their jobs. But this authority of Jesus seemed to extend beyond the tools the scribes had at their hands in sharing the scrolls and writings of those historical teachings. Now, we can't know for sure from 
this text, what Jesus was talking about. But Jesus' words we see later on in his teaching seem to come from a place of awareness of the big picture of God. Like someone who had seen firsthand God's plan for God's realm, the kingdom of heaven that is available to us here on earth through God's grace, just as it is in heaven. We need to listen to this Jesus. Notice also in our scripture what Jesus does when the unclean spirit rises up in the synagogue. Jesus didn't attack the man. Jesus didn't try to beat him over the head with the scrolls. Jesus went after the unclean spirit, not the man. Psychologists tell us that we all have an inborn need to have enemies and allies. This explains a lot in how we can sometimes fight over things without even knowing what it was in the first place that got us so riled up. Thomas Campbell, back in 1807, saw this going on. He was founder of a Christian movement on American soil just over 200 years ago. He'd immigrated from Ireland to the young United States, emotionally battered from attempts to get parts of the church there to work together. Now, hoping for a new start, he was horrified once he got to the United States to find that the divisions had come with the people. Campbell wrote a lengthy document that's called the Declaration and Address, and it's seen by many as one of the most important declarations of religious freedom ever written. Toward the beginning of it, he has propositions for what the church really needed to be about in his eyes. One of the best known of these is Proposition 10. He writes in this that division among the Christians is a horrid evil fraught with many evils. It is anti-Christian as it destroys the visible unity of the body of Christ as if he were divided against himself, excluding and excommunicating a part of himself. It is anti-scriptural as being strictly prohibited by his sovereign authority, a direct violation of his express command. It is anti-natural as it excites Christians to contemn, to hate, and oppose one another who are bound by the highest and most endearing obligations to love each other as brethren, even as Christ has loved them. In a word, it is production of confusion in every evil work. Now, Thomas Campbell had a dream for a church that followed the law of love, where people could work together despite wildly different beliefs and differences, standing together just on the simple belief in Christ. The movement he started is the one we are part of here at Disciples Net, and believe in working together with churches and people of faith everywhere. Yes, in the years since Thomas Campbell, there is much baggage, many failings, but much learning, and we can build on that. We've learned that it is possible to turn hate on its head and not let it consume us. It's possible to be ruled by the law of love. Remember the great commandment that Jesus taught? We find it further on in Mark's Gospel in chapter 12. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing, and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked Jesus, What commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, part of the church's calling is to not turn upon ourselves and neutralize our effectiveness in the world with our petty and our grand fighting division, needing to judge each other for God and to throw out those we see as imperfect and problematic. The damage the Roman soldiers did to the physical body of Christ has nothing on what Christ's followers claiming to love him, have done to the body of Christ that is the church. The body of Christ that is the church has been severely wounded and scarred by human hands, claiming to love and serve God, while hating and judging and condemning their neighbor, even shunning, killing, and mass exterminating them throughout history. 
This is not unique to Christianity, however. Now, some have proposed that the death of the church would be the best thing that could happen to the world. What do you think? That we should lock all the church's doors and throw away the keys, maybe even bulldoze those buildings so people wouldn't have a place to meet. Would that do the trick to get the unclean out of the church? Perhaps Christian author Philip Yancey felt a bit like that at one time in his life. He says, I rejected the church for a time because I found so little grace there. But listen to what he said next. I returned because I found so little grace anywhere else. Church, within and without our boxes and walls, we will always be fighting with those unclean spirits but within the walls of the church, we also find the seeds of grace given to us through Christ Jesus, planted and gathered up from previous generation to generation. Despite its failings, people have kept this church going through mighty works of love, forgiveness, sacrifice, and grace. Some have followed the Master in masterful ways. What we've learned at our best is that we can't kill hate with hate. We can't kill unclean spirits with uncleanliness any more than we can get mud out of our clothing using more mud. But we can smother hate and uncleanliness with love, which can conquer all. In even the toughest cases of evil in this world, God has given us the remedy. But we must work together, especially in those tough cases. The church must find a way to show people how to work together despite their differences that would divide us. Because you see, some, even many of the answers to the problems the church has, comes from the strengths and wisdom and passion of those the world may see as damaged and flawed and weak. In our brokenness, we become more like Christ. We have to be aware of labeling people and situations as good or bad. That's too easy. For even in the greatest tragedy, we can find great triumph and love. And the one who knows firsthand what it's like to be vulnerable, to be ridiculed, to fail over and over, may be the very one who will have the vision of how to move forward in the darkest of nights. Church one with authority to change the world has called us to move forward, to follow Him. We best get moving. I want you to use your imagination. And in your imagination, around this table, over my shoulder here, are the disciples that gathered in that upper room on the first ever Lord's Supper. 
Over here are some of the early Christians that met in houses and shared this meal together. Over there are some of the people who gathered in the first meetings of the Christian church disciples. And over here are some people that we haven't yet seen because they haven't been born yet. All of these people gathered around the table, sharing this fellowship in all times and places, all bringing unique perspectives, all bringing their own spirit to this, this meeting. All welcome here, because the Lord is the host of this table. Some of these people may be difficult for me to get along with. Some of these people may have difficulty getting along with me. And yet, because we are children of God, as I look around the table, I see brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the legacy that those early people gave to us. And this is the legacy that we will pass on to generations that are yet to come. That as we gather at this table, we are all children of God. All brothers and sisters together. All one in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, our God, we pray that you would bring us together. That that same spirit which was in the upper room, and that same spirit that poured out at Pentecost, and that same spirit that drove people to different countries to bring your word, and that same spirit that is with us now, would continue to fill us. Help us to remember Jesus, who did not consider death too much to give, in order to bring us all together. Help us to remember all these people who are surrounding us now, who are coming to this table also to remember. And as we take this bread, and as we drink this cup, empower us to be instruments that spread that good news wherever we go, drawing more and more of your children to this table where we sit now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. And so it is that as we come to the table, we do remember that Jesus on that night so long ago took the bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to them, and he said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this to remember me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is a new covenant poured out in my blood, given for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you drink it, remember me. The Lord has called you. The table is set. Everyone is welcome. Come, share the feast.
Friends, it is an exciting time to be in the church and watch the church grow, even with new tools such as the internet. Whether or not you ever set foot into a physical church building again, whether or not you live many more years or your time is very short, the good news of God is that we are the church together. God calls us each today to work in our own unique corner of the world in our own way, but also to connect with each other across the world. Go now and let God's love work through you in new and amazing ways and see what happens as we change this world together. Amen. Mm -hmm.